eradicate stigmatization in our society, you know, and ultimately create a world where everyone feels supported, everyone feels understood, and everyone is, is celebrated. So we are truly privileged today to have three amazing people come together for this conversation. And I, you know, I guess my hope is that their insights and, and their, their candor and their honesty help to inspire courageous conversations for all of us. So to facilitate the conversation today, we've invited Dr. Joanne Sharp, clinical psychologist and founder of Psych Sustainable. So Jo has extensive training in dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, and radically open DBT. Um, and is extremely passionate about emotion with a particular interest in the use and impact of language. So really a, a perfect fit for this role today. And joining Joe are two genuinely inspiring people, Lady Phil and Remy Arnold. So Phil Apokujima, more widely known as Lady Phil, partly due to her decision to reject an MBE in the New Year's Honours List to protest Britain's role in formulating anti-LGBTQI plus penal codes across its empire, is the co-founder of UK Black Pride and the executive director of Kaleidoscope Trust, which is an organization working to uphold the human rights of LGBTQI plus people around the world. Remy Arnold is a person-centered psychotherapist who works in private practice as well as in partnership with Black Trans Foundation, Black Minds Matter, and Clinic, Clinic Q. Clinic Q, I've said it right, Remy? <laughs> Through this work, Remy often hears that language has been used to harm, but conversely can also be a, a method of healing. And this is so important. It's this understanding that language is not a binary thing, which Remy wants to bring to this conversation today. So it's also worth knowing that Lady Phil and Remy have come together before Front Mind for a beautiful fireside chat called Bringing Our Fullest Selves, which is a heart-centered and enlightening conversation about the importance of, of being able to bring our whole, unapologetic, authentic selves to all aspects of our lives. So Unmind users, you know, I highly recommend checking out this fireside in our firesides category. And those of you who aren't Unmind users, fear not, you can also find this conversation in our resources section on our website at unmind.com. So that's enough from me. It's truly an honor to introduce Dr. Joe Sharp, Lady Phil and Remy Arnold. So Lady Phil and Remy, it's great to have you back. And I've no doubt that we have a special conversation ahead of us. So Dr. Joe, I will hand over to you. Hi, hello everybody. Thanks, Steve. So we're going to start off by thinking quite broadly about language and the use of language to begin with. So Lady Phil, can I come to you initially? Um, thinking about the use of language in kind of a day-to-day -day life you know we all communicate we all use language in one format or another and the language that we can we use can be really inclusive it can also be really divisive have you got any examples that you could maybe share with everybody sort of highlighting some of that Yes, sure. And first of all, thank you so much, Joe and Steve. You know, it's a pleasure to be with Unmind again and also with my comrade and partner in crime, Remy. Well, I shouldn't say partner in crime. We're talking about language here. I don't want that to be misinterpreted at all. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about language, it is really ever evolving and it changes all the time. And one of the interesting ways that language is being used um, to divide, I would say right now, is about the conversation around wokeness, you know, this term woke. So wokeness actually started off as a, as a joke within the black communities. Uh, it was really about, in fact, it took place on black Twitter, there's a, a sort of hashtag handle black twitter and they were taking jabs at each other about you know black people who believe in conspiracy theories and you know black male supremacy and woke became a much bigger it became much bigger as a way of a joke um so i guess in what i'm trying to say here it it was something that people talked about aspiring to um, and that you know people had been cast out for not being woke enough and on the other side of that we see woke being used as something um, that is bad you know even 
in government conversations, I was reading through Hansard's, you know, this was a couple of months back, one of the MPs said, you know, it's, we're not here to talk about being woke and it was in line with the race disparity audit. So I think as far as inclusion, in my personal opinion, I think that the ways that UK Black Pride is using language about say love and rage, which is our theme this year, um, and it's inspired, of course, by queer Black people and the, the thoughts on what it means to be in love, what it means to be angry, what it means to be enraged or disappointed. I think it's all about that breathing. It's all about that right to exercise, how you how you interpret things and just adding on top of that. And I, I know I'm going around the houses because this is language. I speak two different languages. So if we're talking about what does language really mean? My interpretation of various things may be very different to yours, Joe. Um, so I, yeah, I think language is evolving and we take that on board at UK Black Pride because 20 years ago, I was not using the terms they, them, you know, I was not using things like uh, non-binary. So we've grown as our communities grow. I've grown as people are educating me, helping me learn and also unlearn what they don't want. So language is ever evolving. And I hope that sort of gives you a snapshot mm. of what I meant by yeah. growth of language. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's sort of recognising the, the, the specific words that are being used, isn't it? But also kind of the, the subtexts to, to the language that, that's being used. And like you say, there's different languages, different ways of communicating as well. You know, it doesn't have to be always spoken language, is it? Or written language. If you talked a bit there around sort of how language has evolved up to this point, how do you think kind of going forward language needs to continue to evolve? That's, I mean, do we know what might happen in the next 10 years? Is there gonna be some other words that people feel that they want to express themselves and be addressed in that way? Mm -hmm. So it might evolve five years, two years, three years from now. Um, but I, what I should have said, Joe, is that I always find language quite interesting because it's not just about what you say, it can be how you say it. Yeah. So I'm an African woman. I know that people may see me or say, oh, I sound aggressive in what I'm saying, when actually it's just how I've been raised and it's a form of expression. So then they take my language as something that is harsh or I'm being cold or I'm being negative, whereas mm -hmm. that's just my interpretation. And language can also be about body because you've got body language. But then when we start to read body language, I think that there then becomes a policing of how and what we do. So I talk with my hands. Mm -hmm. For somebody that might be interpreted as, oh my gosh, that's a bit full on. So what do I have to do? Do I have to edit myself mm -hmm. to make someone feel comfortable? Or do I keep on expressing myself because it's really just a way of me saying, Joe, I'm feeling really comfortable with you, mm -hmm. that I can talk with my hands. I can say, yes, yes, yes. Whereas I, I, it really depends on settings as well. Mm -hmm. So you're a, you know, you're an academic, you're a, an educator, your role is to understand people, but there are so many different ways of understanding people. And maybe what I'm getting at is that there is no right or wrong way when we may be, in, when we may be expressing ourselves. But I think when we're using words that are harmful and that hurt, then that's different. You know, if you mm -hmm. if I'm called the N word or the B word, or actually if my my comrade, my sibling is misgendered continually, that's harmful. Yeah. And that language must be stopped. Mm -hmm. So I don't call you out, but what I do do is I call you in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and I think you know what what you're saying that there's this we don't know how things are, are are going to evolve over time and I suppose it's just having that openness and flexibility to to listen mm. and hear what people are saying and adapt accordingly isn't it absolutely absolutely yeah. And I think we were going to have um, a poll come up around around this, just sort of asking for, for people's, oh, here we go, asking for people's experiences of language and how frequently they experience language that is either they, they, t- they feel is, is uncomfortable or discriminatory. So let's, if people want to have a look at this and have a... Am I announced what's the moment? I think so. Okay. But while we're waiting for for that, shall we move on to think a little bit about sort of language and how it impacts on mental health? Let me just do this. So, Remy, if you don't mind, can I come to can I come to you next? Yeah, so, of course. <laughs> So kind of thinking, you know, everything that we've just we've just spoken about there, you know, with 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 Lady Phil, you know, all has a huge impact on mental health, doesn't it? You know, how do how do you think that language that we use, that people use in sort of day to day life, how does that impact on mental health? How do you how do you see that sort of in your practice? Well, I think picking up on what Lady Phil said, I love the points that you talked about how it evolves and we're using them and non-binary and I'm I'm a them she, I'm a she they, I'm all up in that space. And so I think it that that language having a way to identify myself is fantastic it gives me a sense of community and belonging but again it can impact my mental health or cause harm when that's not acknowledged when I'm misgendered Mm -hmm. um I've taken restaurants like please stop calling people madam when they sit down just stop it get rid of it you know and I think also not only does it cause harm that's an example how misgendering can actually out me it could put me at risk you know it could you know, and it does to my community. Um, and that can have a horrible impact on your mental health, a horrible impact on deciding whether to go out because you're not sure what you're going to encounter. Mm. And um, I think, Lady Phil, when you talked about speaking different languages, I think it's quite interesting because the language we understand around mental health is rooted in English. Who made these uh, mm. definitions, distinctions of people? Are they the people that are defined by these mental health conditions and needs? No, not likely. So sometimes it's harmful because these aren't terms that you'd want to necessarily be associated with. And I think I'm all for reappropriation of language, reclaiming language, taking it back. I've seen that happen in the queer community, you know, the the reappropriation of the word queer. It's been reclaimed. We're taking that back, but also acknowledging that for some people that will not be a word that can be reclaimed and will sit in harm. And so I think for me, if we're having a conversation about language, we have to be talking about accountability, accountability to when people will say they've been harmed, because I think that's what impacts the mental health. When you raise something, if you take the courage, if, it's, if you have the courage, the energy, the spoons to say, OK, that's hurt. And you're met with defensiveness. You're met with someone being like, oh, but I didn't mean it like that. Actually, that can be incredibly harmful. Um, And I'm glad that you brought about the impact on mental health because sitting in a therapeutic space, talking about experiences, I think sometimes there can be so much emphasis on physical harm, content warning for trauma, sexual harm, sexual abuse. And actually, we can uh, minimise language and what people have said and things that can be internalised and can really shape how you view yourself and see yourself in the world. Yeah. Yeah. That awful old rhyme saying whatever it is the sticks and stones can hurt my bones thing I mean what a ridiculous I don't know where that ever came from and pretty awful isn't it kind of sums that up perfectly yeah yeah and I think sort of you know I guess everything that we we spoke about about earlier you know whether it's sort of mental health related in terms of its content or not you know like like Remy like you've just said and, and Lady Phil earlier everything all of that has to impact on on your mental health in some way hasn't it you know it can't not yeah yeah absolutely the stigma that the language can cause mm-hmm. is really important and also 
yeah, it can make it difficult also to seek support and talk about your mental health or talk about these things because mm-hmm. of the stigma and shame that can be associated with mm-hmm. diagnosis, the language, the behaviour. Yeah. And that was exactly what I was going to ask you next, sort of the, you know, about the language that we use sort of within mental health, you know, to, to speak specifically about mental health stuff, you know, can be, can be really unhelpful, can't it, the language? I think it can be really unhelpful, you know, if there are people, and I say this, there are people that, you know, might identify with having a personality disorder and might like that language, but I can also understand those that think that's really harmful to say I'm disordered, you know, and and things that people have been diagnosed with and, you know, things like hysteria that have been, you know, attached to women and gender for a long period of time and things mm-hmm. like that, that, you know, we're in these clinical spaces have been harmful. And that's why I love the conversation about evolving because we can take that and go, okay, right. Well, where we're at now, we know better. We know we mm-hmm. shouldn't be using this terminology. We need to kick it out. Yeah. And I think that language within, within mental health and around mental health and to do with mental health has has changed a lot it needs to change a lot more but I think there's you know you look back through sort of you know texts or or case histories and stuff like that you know from from years gone by and some of the language is appalling and I'm sure in years to come we'll look back back at stuff now and think our language is is appalling Lady Phil were you gonna say something there? I put up my hand because I (laughs) I, I, um, so, you know, I wanted to just add about, you know, mental health. Sometimes it, it's not always only just a mental health specific, you know, like when we tell people, take it on the chin or take it with a grain of salt, you know, mm-hmm. don't overthink it, it's okay. You know, those can also be really harmful in ways that it suppresses or is telling someone to be quiet. So, mm-hmm. you know, we've got to think about how that, that also contributes to mental health. And one thing I'm, I'm learning or unlearning is that, when we talk about mental health, everybody has mental health. It's when it becomes bad or poor or ill mental health that there are so many different con- uh, contributing factors to it. And, you know, I I was thinking about um, cognitive disabilities or differently abled um, or atypical sort of mental health conditions. And all of these things overlap with each other, don't they? And, you Mm -hmm. know, as they overlap, I then think about black queer lives and the additional compounding of many different things. And we use the word intersectionality quite a lot in, in order to ensure that every approach we're taking has an intersectional lens or approach or framework Mm. to it. Um, And it's not a buzzword for, or a synonym for diversity. It really Mm. is about all of the many different factors that impact on us from race, gender, class, sexual orientation, to disability, to age, to HIV status, Mm. to, you know, so many things that, I guess it, this is where the learning and the evolving and growth comes from, because mm-hmm. I'm sure, I'm sure of it. Next week, somebody will tell me something and say, no, this is, that is quite upsetting or harmful. Um, so just a bit of advice is that it's okay to sometimes get things wrong. It's not okay to continue the wrong, um, but ask how would you like to be referred to? Or how do I say it? Or in what context? Just so that we learn from it. And then the next person we meet, we're not being harmful in our language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and sort of recognising if you've done some harm and doing something about that. You know, not just, you know, because if we, if we think we've done something wrong, you know, we can, you know, if we feel embarrassed about that, so our immediate reaction is to sort of recoil and, and hide a little bit. But I suppose it's approaching it in a in a positive and helpful way, isn't it? Not drawing over attention to to something, but you know, addressing and apologising if you've done something that's that's hurtful. Mm-hmm. And I think you know, when you were talking earlier on about the you know sort of taking things with a grain of salt and stuff like that, it was kind of I guess what was flashing in my mind a little bit was stuff around sort of it just seems to be like a, an absolute wave of, of sort of toxic positivity, you know, particularly online and stuff, you know, and, and, and that kind of does a similar thing of shutting down that conversation, 
you know, if, if somebody's trying to say, you know, I feel really terrible and what they're getting back is you need to think positive, you know, and of course positivity is important. Having hope and having optimism is of course super important, but it's also important to be able to listen and to be able to hear mm-hmm. the difficult stuff as well. Mm-hmm. And I guess the, that overly positive thing, just, it just quietens. Yeah. Helps, and yeah. You know, what does, what does positive look like for somebody that's stamp book may be full up from leaving home to get to work, sitting on a tube? You know, I, I think, you know, positive can be quite subjective, isn't it? About how, how we look at things or, <clears throat> you know, if I'm told, why don't you just smile? I might not have very much to smile about, you know, yeah. and I don't want to come off like I'm taking this moral high ground, but mm-hmm. this conversation is about language. So the way we're all going to learn is by not feeling beat down if somebody mm-hmm. says, I didn't like what you said. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or actually, can you not use that term mm-hmm. around me? Mm-hmm. Because I, I have I have trans siblings and the lived experience of a trans person is very, very different. It's nuanced, it's complex, it's but it's also so beautiful, but they don't all identify with the same language. Yeah. So sometimes it is also worth asking and saying, I'm just asking because I'm trying to educate myself and not mm-hmm. get it wrong. Yeah. yeah. And can I add into that something that I find helpful is when people say, this is how I identify. So I identify as this and I'd like to know how you are. So mm-hmm. actually, they're also extending that vulnerability with their own language to say, this is who I am. And I'd like to get to know you. Just I love that you brought that in because I think that's mm-hmm. so important. Mm-hmm. And it kind of takes us into sort of the next kind of section of the, of the discussion, really, around sort of the, way, the words that we use and how that kind of you know, shapes the, the narrative around mental health and around everything else that's, that's connected to it. And Lady Phil, like you were saying before, we all have mental health in exactly the same way we have physical health. You know, so it's not just talking about, you know, mental health when it gets when it gets poor, it's talking about our mental health as a, as a whole, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, what, what type of, ex- I mean, we, we've, we've talked already a bit about this. Are there, are there any other kind of examples that you've got around how we are shaping that narrative? Oh, you know, the way, how can I put this? The way we shape the narrative, especially from a, let me talk from a UK Black Pride perspective, we tell our own stories. So when we tell our own stories and they're amplified, you then in turn can read that and know how our communities wish to be understood, heard and seen. So, you know, if you don't tell your own stories, it's going to be told for you. And then that narrative will be shaped. Then you will be misgendered or, you know, the harm that comes with poor language will impact our our mental health anyway. So storytelling is so important in helping others understand your communities, your plight, your your fight for equality, your your joys and your happiness. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that we've got to do more of it. I don't think that as, uh, I'm generalizing here, but I don't always think as queer, black, POC, which is people of color, sorry, again, terminology, trying to make sure that I spell it out. I don't always think that we tell our own stories enough. We're not documenting and archiving, you know, our histories, our her stories, our their stories, because that's where I go back to the point of evolution, how language evolves. So if we look back 20 years, we can see people like Femi Otaju, who was the first black African woman on the London lesbian and gay switchboard, And there was a certain language that she had to use to support those who were calling, but non-binary and gender fluid, gender neutral and trans was not always part of that conversation. 
but you fast forward now and I think they've got like document tapes of like the very first conversations and now they use it in how they operate and what they say and what they don't say anymore to people that use or want to use that service so narrative shaping is all about knowing what you have said how you want mm -hmm. to say it now and actually consulting communities about what what the language of evolution will, will look like or should look like mm -hmm. and that there's the, the power of our language isn't it you know there's the power of the language to make somebody feel really terrible but there's also the power of your language that, that can have such an impact in a in a really positive way for yourself in terms of being able to say your own story and your own truth but also other people hearing that and people who, who can't speak up for whatever reason you know hearing your stories is is important isn't it absolutely and Remy thinking about sort of how we use our language for our own well-being because I know sort of I'm certainly guilty at times of being brutal in the way I speak to myself sometimes I think a lot of us are probably a bit guilty of that you know how do we how do we use language or how can we how can we better use our language for our well-being I think sometimes it, for me, I think it's important to interrogate where that negative language comes from, you know, and I'm like, OK, that's not me. That's someone that's caused harm to me and I've internalised that. And then I think I'm going to spout that out. So sometimes it is about, no, catching those, trying gently to catch those moments and be like, where is this coming from? You know, why Why am I doing the work of the oppressor or the harbour for free? You know, and I, and I, I say that and I'm not trivialising it, but just recognising it, that happens. It's so around us. I think first it's about workplaces, places that we occupy, having a firm affirmations having positive language being reflected you know having images of queer folk you know we're having this conversation black folk trans folk over I think that's an important thing to see though the images the positive language around you and being able to internalize that being able to bring that into yourself I think that's important I think for me part of my practice is journaling journaling is important part of me checking where I am in that moment. I can see how my language has evolved, you know, where I started my career journey is very different to now. I look back on 14 year old Remy thought, oh my God, I knew it all, right? And I have no idea now, but that's important to kind of get that sense of self. And also sometimes to acknowledge my younger self, my inner child, and to connect with them and to see when I may be having what I would call for myself as a tantrum and that's not what maybe other people identify being like, okay, so this part of myself, this younger self hasn't been able to play and so I try to bring play, laughter, joy into my life, you know, mm -hmm. as a way to minimise harm. Yeah. I think play is so important. I think often as we grow older <laughs> we lose that fun you know that that you know we become a bit too serious a bit too goal orientated and lose the doing things just purely for, for fun and for pleasure yeah and I, I think actually Lady Phil and I we discussed about um, younger selves and play where we talked before and, and the joy of that and I think that is such an important thing to engage with and also I wanted to be, when I came into this conversation, I was like, I'm not going to name derogatory terms. You all know them. It's, I want to talk about the joy of language as well. Mm. You know, so important having terms to identify with. Yeah. And that's what the point I was going to make. I know that Lady Phil, I think you said you spend time with younger queer people, the younger generation, because they're, that's where language is evolving and coming from, you know. And, and I think that's an important part of the journey as well, to spend time outside of your echo chamber, your diversify who you spend time with in order to have different encounters to learn, mm -hmm. to grow, to develop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What you were saying before, I think at 14, you think you know everything, don't you? <laughs> I think we're all probably a bit guilty of that. But I think it's, it's keeping that open mind, isn't it, to always learning and always hearing and from all different people. Yeah. Sorry, Lady Fellow. No, I was going to say there's some really great comments here in the chat, and I'm so glad I put my glasses on. Especially, Amory said, and Amory, I'm sorry, I don't mean to point you out, but I really liked the fact that you said, you know, 
are the stigma attached to mental health sometimes prevents or stops us from you know sharing our stories or telling you know shaping that narrative and you're absolutely right and I guess this is why movements, community groups, civil mm -hmm. society is so important in finding that space where you feel you do belong or it's inclusive mm -hmm. so that your voice can be heard. Mm -hmm. So that we can try and, you know, debunk these myths and stigmas that are attached to our communities, our lives, our families, our alternative families. So I love that you put that in there because you're absolutely right and hopefully this is part of going to be a series of part of the conversations that go on the resource tool that we can go back and you know maybe there's an action for us all in a year's time let's come back to this conversation and we can probably answer your question joe about how has language evolved yeah yeah, yeah. there was a speaker of comments there was a yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there was a comment earlier, um, Lady Phil, that was asking what you meant when you said you don't call people out, you call people in. So they, they, liked, they really loved the sound of that, but didn't fully understand what you meant by it. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, I, I've learned that, you know, there's so much gaslighting and harm to people when they get things wrong or when they're seen as saying something different and or actually some of this is ignorance around what they know and what they don't know or how they've been raised or taught that this is how you say something that I don't berate people and I'm not going to point the finger and say how dare you and call you out and put you all over social media and put you on blast because actually mm -hmm. you may be dealing with your own issues of mental health you may be challenged by many different things there may be you know trauma that hasn't even been opened up yet so I don't call people out I call them in because I think it's a much nicer way of being able to share with them that what you did actually hurts and I just want to explain it to you but mm -hmm. then there is a calling out when someone continues to do the same thing over and over again intentionally mm -hmm. so calling in for me is you know Remy you know what you said two weeks ago um, I just really want to have a conversation about it. I'm, I am joking here because Remy, I love dealing with. <laughs> I think that we've got this level of understanding about let's unpick and unpack stuff if yeah. we don't understand. So I hope that explains the calling in more yeah. than the calling out. Yeah, thank you. And whose who's responsibility is it to, to change this narrative? Everyone's. <laughs> but uh in that short even it, yeah short answer everyone's responsibility it's it's our responsibility to be open and hear just like you know in that example of you calling someone in lady phil you've got to be open you know if, if someone sets that up with the intention of saying okay i'd like to um you know go back to a conversation we had there's some things i want to raise you have to be open to hearing that and staying with that which can be difficult mm -hmm. and i think that what that what came up for me in the calling in which I think is so powerful is sometimes I don't have the energy to do that and that's why allyship or people who are close to me that might have the energy I can say this has harmed me and I need this person to be called in you know maybe once I can see that they're in a place to hear they're open to listening I can bring myself into that space but we also have to acknowledge sometimes it's too harmful you yeah. know sometimes there's a lot of narrative about yeah we've got to you know stick at it stick at relationships that are harmful stick at people that have said negative things to us and sometimes actually no we we need other people with strength and I don't even want to use that word strength but have the ability in that moment mm -hmm. to do the calling in to do that mm -hmm. conversation on our behalf so mm -hmm. I think also support network is an important part of this you know and it makes me think also about social media we talk about it in so many negative ways but also I think this is a generational way of storytelling a way of mm -hmm. saying this is the narrative this is the language mm -hmm. people are able to self-determine self-define their identities through social media mm -hmm. which is amazing so that shifted a narrative of 
you know newspapers reporting this is how people identify this is their stories people are like you want to hear my story come on my page and you get to hear my story um mm-hmm. so I think that's important as well yeah, yeah absolutely I think it's recognizing some of those things that have just become part of language without even really recognizing you know the, 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 the phrases that you might just say because it's just that that rote learned phrase that's that you know and I guess for, for sometimes the people that are using those things it, me- it means nothing to them it's just a phrase whereas to the people that it means something it means an awful lot and it's really important so I think it's kind of trying to flag those things highlight those things recognize that they can be difficult for people and, and change that and I suppose some of the things I'm thinking about you know is maybe you know we've talked about gender you know addressing you know a, a group of people as only ladies and gentlemen or you know thinking around some of the mental health terminology you know you hear people say you know I'm a bit OCD you know I think it's it's kind of hearing those things that we might be seeing and, and thinking oh, that's maybe not that's not ideal I need to change that yeah and I don't, what's coming up for me in this moment is sometimes those conversations happen in the absence of people in that example who have OCD right I might be, so it's just said flippantly and actually I think that's where there is a role in the absence of someone who is harmed in that moment to mm-hmm. think actually that's harmful you know and I had a lovely conversation with Michelle Ross at Clinic Q about this about you know what would be deemed but I can't even I'm doing this with fingers as that passive you know transphobia that happens or a joke that's told well it's it's not passive it causes harm and just because someone from the identity isn't there doesn't mean that shouldn't be called in yeah yeah Yeah. and this is where your allyship you know that that you mentioned comes in and you know I think uh, Joe Remy allyship is so situational and there are many different things that we can do around allyship. So if I'm not of the trans experience, I'm not of the non-binary experience, and many of our trans non-binary siblings, they're tired, they're exhausted, they're the f- fatigued, they are worn out of the vitriol, the propaganda and the, the hate towards them. How do I step up as an ally with permission, of course, to make sure I'm shielding them? And the same would go for when we talk about Black Lives Matter and everyone's saying all lives matter, but actually who is there to shield and protect Mm -hmm. and to also call in and call out if necessary, the harm that you're doing to a community or a group of people that they may not be part of, but they want to stand in solidarity mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that maybe leads us into, sorry, Remy, were you going to say something there? No, I was just drawn to saying in the chat about someone made a comment about um, language also evolving, but seeing how um, there's power in language, you know, historic language, I think I'm paraphrasing terribly here, but it just made me want to connect with, I am aware that I have ancestors that had a language that was stolen, that was taken. And so when I listen to a lock and Laverne Cox um, podcast about non-binary identities, language that would have named these identities and where we had been enshrined in history has been taken away. So actually, is it evolving or is it trying is it a bit of going back to a place where this language was known and held you know I can't know what I don't know but my deep sense from the histories is that there were was language there before and actually sometimes the removing and the taking away is part of the harm cause so I'm sorry I haven't been able to name the person or the quote but that made me think back and I wanted to just name you know something about my ancestors who are always in me, with me in conversation you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. So kind of moving into sort of the the last part of the webinar I guess what's, you know, we, we were kind of coming to this really naturally anyway, which is great, but I guess what's, what would be really nice for people to, to leave the webinar with is, I guess, just a few kind of real helpful take-home actions. You know, so what, what can people do? What can we do collectively to continue to evolve the narrative around mental health? What can people be taking away and, and doing? 
So firstly, I would say, listen to people from the communities that are impacted, you know, I think that's such an important point. So speaking to people, listening, consuming your media, your understanding from those with lived experience is so important. You know, nothing about us without us, I think is such an important part. And so I think that kind of reform needs to happen or transformation needs to happen within mental health spaces, that the people that diagnose, that talk about health and illness and all of the language associated with that aren't top down are looking on and haven't had those experiences I think that's key for me so in spaces where you're you know in workplaces and you're talking about these conversations or you're writing a policy right who are you inviting you know they might not want to be a part of that that's their choice but who are you inviting from those communities that might be affected by those policies you know I know loads of people writing anti-racist literature at work are you involving people of color in these in these conversations so that this is a moment I would say it's very important yeah, I think that's for me is really important and also challenging when people are not around. That's such an important part, you know, mm-hmm. because when you have privilege, part of that privilege is you get to switch off. You get to be like, yeah, I'm pro black on the march, but when I go home, I don't have no, it, it shouldn't be like that. It should be a continuation. And I think that's important for me. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I completely echo that. And I would say, Joe, you know taking an intersectional approach again to those policies because as you rightfully said if you know if you don't want to be involved in shaping that you have to have a way of being able to consult whether it's those in the workplace the employees whether it's those in the colleges schools hospitals any number of institutions but making sure you take an intersectional approach because the way that mental health which becomes poor or ill that will play out in black and poc communities may be very different to Mm. that that will play out in the lgbt community so there's so many overlaps and i guess that conversation is about usually utilizing the ability to bring or look at those connections, those synergies, the way that our lives interact and interconnect with Mm. each other. Listening is the biggest part of what you Mm. can do to be better and get better Mm. about Mm. how you support, how you show up, how you show out, how you stand up, how you sit down, how you show solidarity. Um, And yeah, that's the most I can say. And, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, keep on, educating ourselves so I always talk about reading and you you mentioned Audre Lorde I'm like oh my gosh Audre Lorde is what has shaped how I see myself and how I'm then able to either articulate or communicate with others about my my own journey my own experience and how I want to be seen and where I want to show up in places so it allows for greater conversation Mm -hmm. so yeah communications is key yeah yeah there's stuff there around there's there's things come popping up in the in the 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 chat as well around you know just trying to take some kindness and compassion you know thinking before you you see something you know talking um, somebody mentioned there about recovery colleges and and you know having people that you know kind of similar to what what Remy you were saying you know people's lived experience of something you know make sure that the right people are involved in whatever it is that you that you're doing and Remy thinking about how we how we use our language and change our language around our own well-being you know so how we how we talk to and about ourselves I guess yeah so I was gonna say I think I would invite can I invite everyone to sort of join me like something that is really important for me is affirmation work is having a daily affirmation practice where I think about something I need to hear Normally I write it near the mirror so I can look at myself and and take those words in. And, you know, I invite everyone here to have an affirmation. And today I really needed it because I'm a beekeeper and my bees have swarmed, which if you keep bees, you know, that is a nightmare. They're right at the neighbours and the neighbours not here. And it's all. And I was like, oh, Remy, you're terrible. You're a terrible beekeeper. And really what I needed to communicate to myself is I'm struggling with the fact that I don't have control in this situation, right? 
and how I'm dealing with that is being really unkind to myself. And so I wrote down something and I would like to share it with you, which is this which is I am beautiful and I trust in my power and I'm saying that to myself to just reaffirm and ground myself in these moments where I'm tearing myself down and so for me that's been an important part is you know curating crafting what I say to myself so as much as I might have these moments where I say things and I catch them I'm also trying to build in moments of affirmation where I say kind things to myself where I affirm what I'm doing in my place in the world right and so today I am beautiful and I trust in my power that's lovely that's lovely I suppose now is a nice time for people to think of their own yeah you know what 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 is the the affirmation that people need themselves to do yeah that's so beautiful I mean I you know oh today I had to tell myself something I was challenged by so many different things and you know I got to this call a minute before we were due to start and I told myself earlier on this afternoon that you are enough and absolutely great at what you do and you have to and I've got it on a post-it note which is in my bag over there because I pulled it out when I went to before my first meeting you know and me telling myself I'm enough means that I'm not going to beat myself down when not everything goes as well as it should do because I'm enough yeah 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 that's the one that, that I often say to myself because you often my harsh narrative is that I'm not and so the the counter to that is you know that's what I need to to hear from yeah. myself um we've probably got a couple of minutes um to go to some questions does that sound okay yeah sure yeah so there's one question here and I apologize I'm not going to be able to get to there's loads and loads and loads of questions here um, how one question here how do people get past their fear of the reaction of others when delivering feedback about how something has impacted them so as a therapist the therapeutic space I love to use that as a place to practice practice kind of so there are many conversations that I've had in my life that happened first in a therapeutic space where that was where I practiced what I needed to say I also think breathing is such an important part of that process. We can hold so much, so much tension in our body. I know you, I can come up, you know, and so just remembering to breathe can really help. Breathing through those difficult parts of the conversation can really help, you know, bring those words out of you in a real practical way. So I think I, I really commend the therapeutic space for a place to practice and also breathing when you're delivering is so important. Um, breathing, yes. Um, I was I was told a couple of years ago to breathe in through my nose for five and out through my mouth for seven, and that helped calm some of the nerves. And I think that it's actually got a, it's a practice. It's called something. I I'm unfamiliar with what that is, but it's so so helpful. I think in giving feedback, and I I manage an amazing team but I've got a lot of people to manage I prepare beforehand mm -hmm. I give myself some bullet points about you know feedback and I read it back to myself because how I may have written it may sound harsh so I may have to you know couch it not so I'm not going to be open and honest and transparent, but I want it to land well. Mm -hmm. But I also think of some praise and some great things about the individual that I'm giving mm -hmm. this feedback to and um, having a nice environment to be able to say it to the individual mm -hmm. if giving feedback. You know, if we're walking down the street, buses are going and, you know, there's people screaming and shouting at each other I'm not going to turn around and say well actually x y and z because it's not going to land well yeah. so carving out that space mm -hmm. to be able yeah. to give yeah. good quality feedback very quickly there's a, a question here and we've talked quite a bit about about gender um, and gender identity 
somebody's asking around sort of trying to understand better the use of pronouns. And I suppose this is a perfect example of saying, I don't fully understand this, please explain this. So the use of pronouns and explaining what your pronouns are, and why is that, why is that important? Well, I, I think, yeah, I mean, oh, Lady Phil, do you want to take this one? No, no, yeah. no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, pronouns are quite an interesting one because they're usually used when you're re- you're referring to someone else or you're talking about that person in the conversation, which is quite an interesting thing because for me, I don't need to use my pronouns ever, right? But it's about affirming that person's identity in the way I would say would use your pronouns, which are mine are they, she, what are your pronouns? Jo? They, she. I'm happy with you. Yeah. yeah. They, yeah, she. So, happy with they there. Yeah. So I, I use your pronouns to engage with you to say, oh, well, Jo, they said this or Jo said that because I want to affirm you and to to be with you and your sense of self when I'm describing you. And that's why it's so important because when you're not doing that for someone and you're referring to them, one, you're continuing a narrative about them that doesn't align with their sense of self and how harmful that can be. You know, it's such a privilege to be on this call and for you to address me with my name because that's how I say I see myself in the world. And actually when people don't do that and they misgender, they're doing that in, for me invariably. They're deciding that I'm not going to refer to you in the way that is important to you, you know. And for most people who don't identify and, and need that, it's, it's just a given. It's a given. You don't even think about it. People are just con- organically using your name, your pronouns, not challenging it. And it's, it's giving people that same, that same respect to just it just be, you know, without question. Yeah, and it's it's interesting you say that because I'm so glad you asked Joe because Joe, I could have misgendered you. I could mm-hmm. have, you know, said, oh, she or he or they, and actually mm-hmm. that's not how mm-hmm. you identify. So it is important that we get this right for that affirming and also mm-hmm. for that individual to feel like we see you. We see you, whether you're called Joe, whether you're called Remy, whether I'm describing you in a meeting context, because you've informed me of how you wish to be identified, how you wish to be seen in this particular space. And it's important that I get that right, because I want to respect you for all that you bring to the table. Yeah. And I also want to bring a nuanced point about pronouns and that is a very important thing for lots of people and it should not be ignored but also we can center that language when actually the trauma and other harm caused with language to trans non-binary folk people that don't use this Mm -hmm. pronouns is is not being acknowledged and I think that's such an important thing to acknowledge other harms that are caused by excluding people from these communities in spaces excluding them from workspaces you know that's also very important you know so I really want to acknowledge pronouns it's a part of the journey but it's not the only thing and that's why language is so important because there's other parts of language that are not inclusive beyond pronouns you know in terms of space and how you're holding space and all these accessible spaces to these gendered communities yeah yeah point there kind of following on from that about titles I also um very frequently assumed or you know kind of again sort of with 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 women in particular you know very sort of marital status heavy aren't they in terms of what your what your title is and it's an odd an odd thing that isn't it in terms of, of titles but I'm kind of aware we've got sort of two minutes to to end so we've, we've kind of run out of run out of time and I think if I think honestly if we'd had double the session we probably could have continued to fill that that space but I think it's such an important topic and a one that's so frequently overlooked isn't it is there anything kind of before we before we finish is there any kind of must say points before we go I wonder Joe, if because there's there's some beautiful, wonderful comments in the chat. And I, I don't read that fast um, because I'm also really focused on you. Uh, 
so I wonder if there's things in there that there are questions that maybe we can regroup afterwards and try and respond to them because there are 300 plus people on the call which is amazing and I always want to feel like I've given the most of myself so after this mm -hmm. only if it's possible that maybe we can respond to some of the comments mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think yeah. that would be lovely. We'll find a way of find a way of doing that. Yeah, I was gonna say exactly the same thing. I'm like, I don't want to lose it. My sense of grief and loss is just kicking in. So I was glad you named it, Lady Phil, because you've helped me there. But I think it was just lovely to be in this space together. And I think there is so much to come from this conversation. And for me, I hope that lots of people, this is a beginning. This is a beginning. It's a beginning of them sitting with themselves, the language they use. And yeah, and I hope this is the beginning of many more conversations of this nature. Yes, absolutely. And we've got if because we've talked about a lot of a lot of stuff, haven't we? And there's some some information just popped up on the screen here, which if anybody's kind of really struggled with any of the content, this is just some helpful organizations and resources that you might want to to look out and um you know and seek support through um but otherwise i think we have you know we've come to an end thank you everybody for for being involved sort of in the conversation but also all of the amazing the amazing chat and we will we will you know like we both say we'll we'll come back to that um so i hope, hope everyone's enjoyed it as much as the three of us have and so i think we'll we'll say goodbye and enjoy the rest of your enjoy the rest of your evening everyone yeah and thank you, Joe, for being such a brilliant moderator and yeah. and host. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. My alarm's just ringing to say we're off. <laughs> <laughs>